Welcome to the Scarborough Board of Education meeting. Tonight is Thursday, February 16th, 2017. May I have the attendance, please? Mrs. Bealey? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Mrs. Massengill? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Ms. Hobb? Mr. Vachon? Okay, will you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, are there any adjustments to the agenda? There are no adjustments tonight. Okay, 5.0, are there any public comments on agenda items? Seeing none, we will move right on to 6.0, new business. Meeting minutes of January 5th, 2017. Do I have a motion? Move approval as presented. Second. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Six. Thank you. Uh, 6.2, meeting minutes of January 19th, 2017. Move approval as printed. Second. Any comments on those? <coughs> okay. All in favor? <coughs> Six. Six point three. Motion to approve the 2017-18 Portland Arts and Technology High School budget. This was uh, we have discrepancy in some of the math on the sheet from last time. Do we have a motion? Anyone? Move approval is printed. Second. Any questions or comments? And there wasn't a discrepancy on the numbers. It was right. just the dates. The dates. The yes. Years. Yes. We, you actually had FY17 assessment rather than the FY18 right. assessment. So the now numbers what you didn't match up. I just, uh, I have no problem with the budget, and I just want to iterate what I've said before, that, that I really am sad that so few students avail themselves of the programs at, at uh, the technical schools, and I just wish there was some way we could, we could fix our schedules, because I am certain that there are others, more students who might attend. If, if somehow their core program at Scarborough High School could be arranged so that they could do both. So that is something that we're looking at as we're um, transitioning to a proficiency-based education system, but we're also looking at graduation requirements and what kind of educational experiences we're offering students. Um, but also within Scarborough, but really it's about changing the mindset around what c uh, career technical education is and means. Um, I know that there's still some people who think that you're either on a, like a college track or you're going to a technical on a career technical education track, but the reality is that CTE, <coughs> the career technical education opportunities are still college bound pathways. And so it's just about kind of rebranding, re but also re-educating folks around, um, you know, how it can support their their college dreams, you know, through a technical piece of that education, if that makes sense. And so one of the things that um, I was wondering about is like other students who go to WPI or MIT or you know go into engineering, how many of them are taking advantage of the, the CTE opportunities either at Pabst or Westbrook? And right now the numbers are really low, so we're thinking mm -hmm. about how can we kind of shift that mindset. Well, when they offer the CNA program at Westbrook, they offer an early childhood education program over at Westbrook, the culinary arts piece. So there's other things other than the engineering piece. So, yep. so many other universities they could, you know, assimilate to. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions or comments? Okay, all in favor? Six. Thank you. Now we are at 7.0 or 7.0, our workshop session. And first up, 7.1, tech talk. Um, I think you got a handout already. Um, so we're going to talk about where we're at at 
this point and some of the decisions that we've made just because we are so late in the budget cycle. I know it. Just please yeah. slide that down to where you're looking. I know, I don't know where to stand. Is right, that good? That's good. If that's good for you. The biggest okay, thing so is the mic then for people at home. Okay, so I, I guess for anybody back there, if, if you guys can't hear me, let me know. Um, <clears throat> first, I want to start off, though, because in all the years I've been giving this presentation, I don't think that I've ever given you kind of an overview of the technology department and kind of what we do, who we are, who we service. So I wanted to do that first. Then we'll talk about kind of a five-year retrospective. I sort of felt like it was important this year because this is really the first year in Scarborough that we are completely one-to-one -one with devices K-12. Something to celebrate. So I thought we would take a look back over the last five years because five years ago, 2011, 2012, we only had one-to-one -one devices in grades seven and eight. So we'll take a look at that too. Then we'll talk about some of the things that we did. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to breeze through all this quickly so we can get to MLTI. If you have questions, stop me. You guys know the trouble. Okay. So, I'm going to overview through that, and then tech cycles. We'll talk about that at the end too because those have changed. So, the, the technology department uh, is downstairs. We're the cellar dwellers. There's eight of us, so eight full time staff. We service both the town and the school. So we're a shared services department. Um, Julie and I were talking about that the other day. I think that that provides an enormous amount of <coughs> um, cost efficiencies for the town overall, for the town and school. Because if you think about it, and in talking to some of my, um, my colleagues in other schools, if you are split out into two different um, segments of municipal and school, you're now, you've got two sets of servers, two sets of switches, two sets of routers, two networks, two sets of people who are having to maintain that. So it just makes sense to kind of have that <coughs> collaboration. So our group services about 1,300 employees, both town and school, and that includes seasonal employees, per diem employees, um, you know, a lot of different folks, but we do have to work with each and every one of them when they come on board, if for no other reason to set them up with uh, email accounts and access to different systems. <coughs> um, we have about 3,100 students. Uh, we have approximately 6,500 end user devices, and by end user devices, I mean, of course, things that you know, laptops, desktops, tablets, but phones, we maintain the entire phone system, uh, printers, multifunctional devices, dock cameras, projectors, <laughs> all of that falls under technology to actually in the end maintain. Purchase, deploy, and maintain. Um, we've got 17 locations. That includes all the fire barns, the schools, uh, public safety, public works, this location. Approximately 90 switches, 62 servers. So that's all sort of the back end stuff that you guys <laughs> never see, but sort of runs everything. Um, and we have about 50 critical applications. We have many, many other applications that we maintain um, in, in different images, but the 50 critical applications are kind of like the core systems that run things like payroll, um, run like the public works core system. <coughs> Dan, can I just interrupt for one second yeah. just because you're talking about number of students. I just want to correct something that was in the Portland Press Herald um, story yesterday about <coughs> snow days and superintendents were talking about um, how they make the snow call, and it was just quoted in that article that we only had 2,700. 2,297. Yeah. Oh. What's the article? It was way, it was way under. 2,907. Right. 97 or something like that. It was, it was under, anyway, yeah. what our actual numbers are. So just because we're talking about number of students, I want to correct that in case anybody else caught that in the Press Herald yesterday. But it was too low. And of course, these are always sort of moving numbers right. because we'll take a snapshot at the very beginning of the year, mm -hmm. and that doesn't always um, capture the kids who have moved out of the district or right. go to private schools or whatever. <coughs> um, so our major areas of responsibility it kind of falls into four major categories. We do software hardware, so any software that comes in, one of the things that we have to do is there's a tech request form. It can be on the town side, it could be on the school side. The school side process <coughs> is you, if you're an end user, you fill out the form, you send it to Monique. Monique takes a look at it for actual functionality. Is this going to do what the end user thinks it's going to do? 
Um, when she approves it, it comes to IT, and then, and then we really have to vet that piece of software. So does it work on our systems? Does it work with our operating system? Does it work with our hardware? Does it play well with others in the sandbox? Um, and then we, uh, once we determine that it's actually going to work with our systems, then we'll go about how are we going to get it onto the image. So as you can imagine, every single piece of software, if we have to push that out to 3,000 devices, or including desktops, you know, it could be 4,500 devices. It's a big job, <laughs> and so we do try to, um, we, we have tried to sort of streamline that by getting some efficiency software that allows us <coughs> to actually push that software out um, from centralized console. Um, we do all the hardware, so as I mentioned before, uh, that whole laundry list of um, telephones and um, computers, desktops, laptops, whatever. Something that um, Julian thinks was surprised by the other day when we were talking about things that people don't really think of that we have to touch. Um, there's going to be a new vending machine, and that vending machine is going to be actually part of our lunchtime program mm -hmm. application. Um, so it's, there's a piece of software that has to be loaded there. It has to have a network drop. It has to um, be connected on the back end. So there's a lot of moving parts that on a day-to-day -day basis we have to get involved in. Um, network infrastructure telecom, so as I mentioned, we do the telecom system for the entire town. We also maintain the infrastructure for the entire town. So all the fiber connectivity, all the Wi-Fi, the wireless access point, um, basically anything that has to do with computer systems, with getting connectivity, we are the ones who connect on the back end. And then the network on the back end, we maintain all of that. So as I mentioned before, the switches, the servers, the routers, <coughs> all of that stuff that you don't see, that's also under our purview. Websites and online presence. So our department is responsible for the website of the town, the website for the school, the intranet for the town, and the intranet for the school. We also um, get involved in any other kind of application that potentially is online. So we were involved in the deployment of the lunchtime program. Um, we tend to get involved in things on the town side, like the public works core system. Um, we help out with new systems, basically any of that kind of online presence. And we are working with people on a regular basis with social media as well. So if you want to find a Facebook page, if you want to a Twitter feed, that falls under us to kind of help get those accounts up and running. Um, and then administration, and that's kind of where we manage all the projects. We put together the team, we manage the budget, you guys know personnel management, you know, administration. So we have eight full-time staff. Um, so that was just an overview of the department. I feel like that was important for you guys to know exactly what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, this is just a quick snapshot of, from so I say five-year trends because it's really 2011-12 and then 2016-17. Mm -hmm. So if you look at that five-year spread, we have almost doubled the number of end-user devices in the Scarborough School District. Those are end-user devices that we touch on a daily basis and have to manage and maintain. <coughs> so where, where are those devices? What, where have the increases occurred? <coughs> if you take a look here, ML, MLTI laptops. So we talked about how when five years ago, we, ha we were one-to-one -one just in seventh and eighth grade. When we refreshed in the last refresh cycle four years ago, we opted to include the sixth grade in there too. So that's kind of where you see that increase. And then just a natural increase of laptops. You guys know we went one-to-one -one with Wentworth. We went one-to-one -one with um, the high school. Chromebook, we had zero, then we had five because we went one-to-one -one with Chromebooks and the K2s. Um, our carts, obviously, desktops have gone down, which is a good thing because once we got one-to-one -one devices in the hands of the kids, we could do away with all of those desktop labs that took up a lot of space. So those are getting some interesting new uses. Um, and then printers, which I'm really happy about that number because we had 261 printers way back and we have a printer on every single desk. Mm -hmm. And um, we took a look at it, it's really that cost efficient because you got to get the cartridges and they were, you know, the, the inkjet printers. So um, working with Kate, we went through and we took a look at where could we strategically place 
types of student printers, you know, high end, high um, output printers. We put those throughout the schools and then um, really made use of the multifunctional devices. So those are the like high capacity printers, scanners, copiers. So I'm happy about that because that reflects a huge um, cost savings <coughs> at the end of the day. We used to have 50 meg down at, for bandwidth, 50 meg down at the middle school, and then 50 meg in the rest of the town. And now we have a gigabit, and we have 500 meg down at the middle school. So I know that probably doesn't mean a whole lot to you, <laughs> but it's really like big. a straw <laughs> versus a fire hose. Yeah. That is pretty much you know how, how it would compare. So that, mm -hmm. that's sort of the five-year trend. Just give me a look at sort of how all of these, oh, my little tags disappeared. So how all of these um, break out. You see laptops, the green place there are Chromebooks. So really in terms of mobile devices, that's what makes up the majority of what we manage on a regular basis. So I thought, well, we can't really put these slides in without also kind of drawing some conclusions about and kind of letting you know what has come about from all of this technology, right? Because it's great to give a kid a laptop, but what are you really doing with it? Are you using it? So what we have seen, and I will preface this by saying that we do have a survey um, called Bright Bites that has gone out to each phase level or is yet to go out to some phase level. Okay. Um, and the students and staff take this survey and they tell us um, a lot of interesting data, their opinions about um, how they're using it, how it's embedded in the curriculum, how, um, how functional it is on a regular basis. So what we promise to do is later, um, after we get all of the results and we have a chance because it is data intensive. Mm -hmm. there's, I mean, there, there's so much information there that we kind of have to cull through it. We'll pull out some highlights for you guys and later we'll present to you guys kind of what the staff and students are saying about it. But suffice it to say that really we keep picking up in proficiency. And you can go from, what is it, to emerging, emerging to, um, exemplary. <coughs> to exemplary. And what we see <coughs> is there's a lot of, we, we've made um, jumps from emerging to proficient in quite a few categories. So we will show you guys that. But what we see is increased mobility. So what this means is you, know, you see the kid that has the laptop and the Chromebook, and now instead of having to drag around every textbook you know, to man mm -hmm. and only being able to you know, write their papers and then they lose a piece and whatever, they're able to take these laptops with them, work on um, things from home, work on the bus, work on, you know, if they've got downtime at a game or a, a track meet or whatever, they're able to, to um, have that sort of blended personalized learning, which is at the point of learning anytime, anywhere, whatever's convenient for you. To that end, we talked last year about Google, about how we finished up in this year, <coughs> we finished up a two-year migration to Google, so we're now fully Googleized mm -hmm. in Scarborough School District. Um, we have Google Drive, which is Google Sheets and uh, Google Docs and uh, all, uh, all kinds of other applications in there, um, but we have migrated fully so that the kids, even if they don't have their own device, they can still access all of their work and everything that their teacher expects them to do through Google Classroom or however else they're, they're um, communicating with each other. <coughs> um, globalization is sort of, I think another term kind of thrown around quite a bit, but really what we see is a lot of classrooms are now able to communicate and collaborate um, with classrooms around the world. So, for example, I know that there were classrooms that um, tracked the IBO when the IBO was um, released into the wild. And I think they were communicating with Ireland, Ireland a classroom in Ireland. Yeah. So, really kind of shrinking the world down, learning more about, you know, other cultures, other, other people, and, and it's not, um, you, you know, you're not having to get on a plane and go there anymore. You can kind of have that Skype session or Google Hangout with them. Um, digital citizenship is some, something that we have really, really worked hard 
to get out into the field, particularly knowing mm -hmm. that when you roll out one-to-one -one devices, you also have to make sure that kids are safe and secure online, that they're using the devices in um, the proper ways and taking care of them in the proper ways. We were talking earlier about what, what does digital, digital citizenship really mean? And it's a combination of really sort of cyber security, being safe online, protecting your identity. Um, well, it's also communication and branding yourself online, making mm -hmm. sure you're not posting things that are inappropriate, nothing ever goes away online. But it's also mm -hmm. etiquette and communication. Yes, um, but it's also copyright. You know, can you just mm -hmm. grab anything off the internet and call it your own because it's there and it's free? Yeah, and I think that's <coughs> something that's emerging mm -hmm. because it's kids do research all the time. That, you know, you come across different sites. I think there's a difference too that we're trying to teach them between what's real and you hear fake news all the time, what's real and what's not real, mm -hmm. and kind of making that determination on your own. And then collaboration and communication. We already talked about that a little bit, but I really, I see it all the time. I saw it when my daughter was at Scarborough High, and I see it now when she's at college. Um, you know, they get online with each other in Google Docs, and they can collaborate on a document, they can collaborate on a project, they can be completely across campus, they can be, you know, in different countries, it doesn't matter, so. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> what grade, uh, at what grade do our youngsters have the uh, ability to take their their computer home. Is that still six through twelve? It's seven. Yeah. At seventh grade they start yes, taking them home. They can take them home. Yeah. But you said that if they have a de device at home, they can access our network through the global through uh, Google? They can access their account through Google, not mm -hmm. our network. Yeah. So if, if I'm a fifth grader and I'm on my home computer I can still do my work, my school work. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Can I just ask one question? Um, I know originally, or I, at least I think I know, the reason why sixth graders originally weren't taking them home is because it was their first experience using laptops. But now we have kids coming from Wentworth and have had them since third grade. Is there a reason why sixth graders aren't able to take them home? Is it a developmental I think that's appropriateness? Gonna I think that's going to change this yeah. year. I was just wondering because they are coming we've, from. We've been having conversations around that. Yep. Um, and with the refresh, it's an opportunity to take a look at the whole scope of things, including the education and the parent education pieces right. as well, because that's a big part of that. Yep. So we've been having those discussions. And, and you're right, because I do think <coughs> that having gone through Wentworth, um, they go through a lot of training about yep. proper care of the devices. And I love it when I walk through Wentworth. They're, they're super militant about it. They're having very, devices, yeah. they are so good about it, yeah. yeah. And I actually just, I try to routinely go through and take a look at our damage and maintenance um, percentages. And the average, so Wentworth, they're heading into their third year now of having devices. And their average over three years is 1%. Yeah. 1% maintenance and repair rate. They take it really seriously. They do. Yeah. yeah. And some of that's just like a natural or you know, something falls yeah. or whatever. But yeah, they do take very good care of those. They do across the district. Mm -hmm. I will say that because in looking at those percentages, <coughs> even at the high school, in year two, it still hovers around 3% damage or repair. There wasn't, there was one device last year that we didn't get back at the end of the year, but the rest of them we all got back. And there was a reason for that. 3% district wide? No, in high school. In high school. school. Yeah. Um, middle school is MLTI, yeah. so they keep their own records, and, and we kind of, you know, hot swap them out with the state. Um, Wentworth was hovering around 1%. Um, in KCU's, we really don't have data yet, yeah. so at the end of the year, I'll be able to kind of sift through that. So K2 Tech Refresh, this was a project that we had this year. Um, this was our one-to-one -one, the Chromebooks. We did do quite a bit of functional requirements definition with staff um, down at the K2 level. We met with different groups at different schools and we asked them, what is it that you need to have in a device? What do you think the, te the, the students need to have in a device? Um, and so we put together that whole list. We went out and found devices that we thought would match it. They tested them. 
um, we ended up getting the ACES um, Chromebooks, and so far, so good. So we rolled them all out. Um, huge shout out to Courtney Grafius because she was really instrumental in getting these out into the hands of the students um, and doing the training, the safety and security training. Um, with that, we did have a shift because we had to migrate um, from basically a software-driven environment to a cloud environment, which was, it is a shift of a mindset. So on the Chromebooks, I don't know who here has Chromebooks. Anybody have Chromebooks? Um, Chromebooks um, are, are portals to the web, basically. They don't have a lot of internal memory, so you can't really store software on there, run software. So really, it provides a great tool to access Google, to do online research, you know, if you wanted to Skype, whatever, hit YouTube. Um, so it was like a, it was, a, it was a definitely a mindset shift to get everybody to a cloud environment. But they did a great job with it. What we did was we got lists of software that they use <coughs> on a regular basis, and then we went and found the equivalent um, in online apps. And for the most part, we didn't really run into any. There were a couple of, <coughs> couple of special services software pieces that were not replicated in the cloud environment, but we made some accommodations for that. <coughs> um, with that refresh, aside from the one-to-one -one Chromebooks, we did projector installs in the gym, which was a huge project. Um, that was a massive project. Um, but it allowed them to have whole school assemblies in, in one location, because prior to that, they couldn't, there wasn't any place that they could all kind of meet, um, have their graduations and whatever. Um, we also, just to let people know, so we did have some devices, a small amount of devices, laptops. Anybody who had um, kids in any of the K2s knows that each uh, classroom had three laptops in it that the kids would trade off on. Uh, they were old. They were, we call them the bricks because they're heavy, you know, they're big and heavy. They are workhorses, so we pulled them back, we redeployed them to different places. So for example, down at Wentworth, the Tech and Photo Club was looking for um, a number of devices that they could use with that club. It was a great place to put them, because they are big machines. You don't really want to take them home and carry them back and forth, but they're great to just sit there and you know, run whatever applications we need for after school activities. So we have redeployed them. We do have a number um, that we're cleaning up, and we do plan to continue to redeploy them. I keep forgetting to ask questions about any of that. Miss writing mine down for the end. Oh, okay. So other projects. And I'm going to rip through this quickly. So we expanded Wi-Fi coverage on campus. Um, we had a request specifically from the athletics department to put some more uh, Wi-Fi access down on the field. Um, so you may or may not have seen a giant antenna that was erected down there <coughs> by the field house. Um, that was a big project, but it does, does allow them to do, for example, streaming video of games. So they have um, a, a mount that they put on their camera and they could potentially you know, run along the side of the field and stream that out live on the web. Um, we normalized tech at the high school, so we were entering into our second year of one-to-one -one at the high school, and there were some you know, things that we had to work out, some things with the image. Um, there was some spotty Wi-Fi coverage in some areas, so we went in and replaced some access points and things like that. Um, we began the middle school tech refresh, which I will get to. We did go in this year and replace the middle school network completely. So if you recall, <coughs> when we went with MLTI, uh, the last refresh, we decided that we were going to go with the state network, state provided network. Um, that was not all that reliable over the past three years. So we worked with them constantly to try to get them. They rebooted APs, they replaced APs or access points, the Wi-Fi access points. Um, they re re rebooted them, replaced them. Uh, we did some more wiring. We did um, heat maps that kind of show the coverage. And we still couldn't get it. We were still, for example, with portables. We were losing connectivity all the time, despite having a ton of bandwidth. So we finally just made the decision last summer, just we're going to take it all out and we're going to put our own network down there. 
Uh, people were also running into issues, for example, if you are not on our network and you're trying to wirelessly connect to a projector, you can do that. So this allowed people to have you know, the same kind of access, the same kind of functionality as everybody else on campus. So we were so happy that we did that because we haven't received any complaints so far about latency down at the high school about connectivity. So I, I mean, that's middle school. So I think things are good. We also were really happy we did that because the state announced that they are not going to have the network coverage anymore. Um, they're going to leave it in place for question mark, <coughs> question mark, and then that's pretty much just going to go away. Um, online testing deployment, this is something that we do every single year. The state likes to switch it up on us. So um, it's, a, it's a big job for, for somebody in my department, though, to, to kind of test those, um, test the access and, um, and the, the client issue, the kiosk, yeah. and yeah. certify that we're site ready. Mm -hmm. um, we did, I've been promising for years that we were going to develop a disaster recovery business continuity plan, and we did do that this year. So we have some things that are, that sort of, we realized that came out of that plan that we need to work on in this next year. So there will be some budget items. For example, we really would like to have a recovery hotspot located south of here. So in one of our buildings south of here so that if we <coughs> lose um, connectivity, we can pick it up and create redundancy down um, in the Blue Point Dunstan um, area. So you that will be included in the budget to share. Um, and then we really worked hard to do a lot of information security training. That was something that we felt was kind of lacking. We had been talking for a couple of years about how to deliver this. Um, so Alicia, Thornton and Biggs, and I are going out and delivering this presentation, um, what seems like every other day, <laughs> <laughs> to groups in the schools. And I think it's an eye-opening experience for them. I think there's um, things that they kind of didn't realize in terms of protecting their identity and protecting their, their assets and protecting their, their family's um, network as well. So moving forward in 2017, 18 and beyond, we'll continue with the disaster recovery business continuity work. Um, as I mentioned before, we do have some work to do in terms of um, getting a co-location facility. We are looking at running some additional fiber um, so that's, we're sort of scoping that out now. Um, we will be doing additional training. We've been talking about doing sort of lunch and learns or, you know, training at where the, the, where the users are as opposed to trying to make them all come to a, a, a training session or a conference where we are. So we're trying to get out into the field and really deliver that hands-on to them. Um, we are looking at more STEM STEAM support. So how can we support um, Julie's vision of where STEM theme is going within the district. Um, and then the middle school tech refresh. And that's been a, 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 big, um, a big issue for us. So <coughs> I'll get right to that. Before I do, did you want to ask your question? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they're not really questions, but they were just sort of things that I wanted to highlight. Um, with the blended and personalized learning, I think it's important and, you know, I'm on the board so and I hear you give us these presentations and I feel like I understand what's going on, but I think for parents to see their kids actually implementing it, it's amazing. My daughter had the flu for a week this year and she was able to keep up be, and there was um, a partner program that she had to, she was working with a partner. Well, the first day her partner was out and they were able to communicate because they got on the computer and did their thing. Then the next two or three days, Riley was out, and they continued to communicate. And by the end of the week, neither one of them had ever been together in the classroom, but they had a completed project by the end of the week because they were able to communicate with their documents and the Google Classroom and all of that. And the teacher would go in at night and make comments and help them along. So it was like incredible to see the whole thing go, and they were never in the classroom together yeah. that whole week. So. I found that interesting, and it, it's just a lot of learning, I think, for the adults to figure out how this all works, rather than the kids who are totally on top of it. Um, and I thought your 
information about the printers, how we had gone from 261 to 94. There was also some savings in waste there, too, if I remember correctly, because um, like people were printing and then the paper was just sort of hanging out, yeah. and now you, you print once you get to the printer. So thank you. <laughs> you print once you get to the um, printer. Yeah. So there's a lot less waste, and um, the resources are actually being used once they're printed. Yeah, and that was part of the paper cut, so the yes, sort of that was um, printer consolidation. So paper cut, I think we've talked about that before, centralized print, right? Yeah, so what we did find, it was funny because it was actually one of the um, admins out at one of the K2s that said to me, oh my goodness, I'm seeing so much less, you know, wasted documents coming off the printer because you have to go to any printer and you type in your code. But if you really didn't want to print that or you forgot about it, it will cancel itself out after a certain period of time. So that's been great. And if I go into, I do routinely, I mean, you know, it makes it sound like I have no life. I really don't. <laughs> I, I do go into all these reports and all these databases and I look at all of these numbers all the time. But if you go into, um, I, I went into one specific school the other day and just ran a report on you know every job, every print job, everything that was abandoned, and there were a significant number, double double digits of jobs that were abandoned. So that was it. That's all I had hmm. so far. Okay, so <coughs> MLPI. I think you guys have probably heard in the news all kinds of stuff. So I'll give you the good news is that we're not an Apple school, so we didn't have to deal with that whole buyout refresh mess. Um, I all, almost all of my colleagues here in Southern Maine, when we get together and we talk about it, they're all Apple schools. And some of them, one of them got an $80,000 bill for damaged devices. I won't even go into, that was, that was, it's a whole long process of how that happened and why that happened. Um, the state did pull back on that and they said, okay, you don't have to pay for the damaged devices, but you do have to pay for the missing devices. And so now that has started a whole new cycle of issues because there's discrepancy between what the state says is missing and what the schools actually say they have or have ever had. Um, so we don't have to deal with any of that. I, I was thinking about you guys when I kept seeing on you know, the news, on <coughs> these reports about it. We have nothing to do with that. As an HP school, um, we do plan to buy the devices at the end, so I'll cover that when we get to it. Um, the network infrastructure was another piece. It was kind of a surprise when um, MLTI said, the DOE said that they weren't going to cover um, the network infrastructure anymore. And I think they're still sort of developing what they're going to do for schools. But again, you'll probably hear that in the, in the news. And we have nothing to do with that because once we took that network out of middle school, we, we sort of saw this coming back in April. Okay, we started to have some statewide meetings um, with MLTI representatives. And I started to get not a great feeling mm -hmm. about the direction that things were going. So we started to position ourselves so that we were not going to be dependent on MLTI for anything. That was a big part of the reason why we took the network out of the middle school, <coughs> because we just didn't want to be dependent on them, thankfully. Um, what they're saying now, is MLTI as it has existed in the past. So in the past, way back before this past refresh cycle, they had Macs, MacBooks, and, and so you would you know, put in your numbers for how many seventh and eighth graders you had and they would send you the MacBooks and um, you would use them for four years and then you would send them back and the whole thing would refresh. The last time around they gave you a choice between um, HP is between Windows and um, Mac devices. This time around, um, there was a considerable number of school districts in the state that started saying, we want Chromebooks. We don't want Macs. We don't want laptops. Chromebooks are, are going to be good for us. Um, the state didn't want to provide Chromebooks. Um, and I, again, this was something that we sort of saw, we, we could see this coming um, back in the spring, that this was potentially going to unravel, and I didn't want us to be left in a bad situation. So we started back in the spring to look at Chromebooks. 
and to say, okay, that's probably the least expensive solution, and would this be an option for us? So we started to do requirement definition sessions with the teachers, um, with the staff down at the middle school back in the spring, and then we continued it on to the fall. What they're saying now from the state is that they are going to have some kind of grant process. So each district is going to have to apply for a grant from the state to cover their devices. Again, just seventh and eighth. They are no longer going to provide, they used to provide um, devices for high school teachers and they, a bunch of, and you could lease other devices. So for example, we lease our children's great laptops through the MLTI program. They're not going to um, uh, offer that anymore. So we have asked repeatedly what is this grant process going to look like? what um, are going to be the qualification parameters and what we've heard back and there's a group of tech directors in Southern Maine that have, you know, we've written letters to um, the head of the DOE and to Mike Beer and MLTI and to different people. Um, and what we've been told is at some point in the future, um, you will get more information. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so, and I think the last I heard was the end of February, but I haven't heard any updates since then, so I'm thinking we might not. So, I don't know how this is going to go. I'm just going to be honest with you. I, my suspicion is it could be a needs-based grant, which if that's the case, um, we're we, yeah, we, we wouldn't qualify for the entire amount of 7th and 8th grade. Um, so, again, we kind of saw this coming, and so we positioned ourselves to be able to provide one-to-one -one devices, six, seven, eight, and fit it fairly well and fairly easily within what our normal tech refresh budget would be for the middle school anyway. So, the last two things I have on here are buyout, just to, to let you know, the, the buyout um, at the end of the Windows cycle, it's going to be $18 per device. What we've been told is you have to buy all of them or none of them. Mm -hmm. So we have a thousand. Mm -hmm. So I started to kind of look at the numbers, and my staff initially was just like, "No, <laughs> we, there's no way we can even store eight, store a thousand of these." But I started to think that if we look at Wentworth, that has those same devices. If we bought a portion of these devices from the middle school, then potentially we could take Wentworth out another year because we would have a large pool of hot spots. So we started to look at that. Um, I went back to the state and I said, well, um, can we sell the devices off to other school districts? And they said, that's not the way the DOE works. And um, I said, well, can we ship it back to you? And well, there's a six month waiting period. So long story short, we're going to buy them because right at this very moment we have 17 devices that are dead in the water and need to be, basically we would have to pay for a full replacement anyway. So at $500 each, we're, yeah, we're, we're pretty close to what we would pay for the 18,000 for the 1,000 devices. Um, by the end of the year, we'll, I, I feel confident that we'll easily meet that $18,000. So our plan is buy these collect them. We will clean them. We will re-image them. We're going to reserve 300. The intent is to ship as many as possible, sell as many as possible back to the state, or if they allow us potentially to another school district. I already have school districts that want them. So I, I think that we can work this out to our advantage. If we are buying them, do we not then own them? Yeah. Yes, but there's, I know. I know. Why can't we offer them to say Wentworth family to say this is the device your child uses during the day at school? If you'd like to have one at home, here you can buy it for 50 bucks. And we'll give it to you to have at home. So we talked about that too. Um, that is a huge undertaking for my staff because what we're hoping is we're going to take the two or three hundred that we reserve as hot spots for Wentworth and we yep. clean them, we image them, and the rest of them we're just going to ship yep. back. Yeah, so we don't really have to touch them a whole lot. We might have to wipe them back to factory settings. But this, we've had bad experiences in the past with this selling them to other folks just because it, it then seems like it comes from us 
and there's some kind of implied warranty with that, mm -hmm. and so we, I just don't have staff to service yeah. that. So the, the hope is that we will actually potentially <coughs> if you get some money back from the 18,000 that we spend purchasing the devices, if we do manage to sell them off to other districts or back to the DOE to then sell off to other districts. Jen, can I, can I just add that it, it's not just a hardware issue when you say the same device. Um, we pay for subscriptions and licenses yeah. on that and an image True. that, that um, we could not right. sell that as well. So it would not be the same as what their child has in school. True. <coughs> well, the way you would get it is right. completely wiped to factory settings yeah. and yeah. you wouldn't even have an operating system on it. Right. So then yeah. you've just bought yeah. a five-year-old device that doesn't so even have you know, buy the operating yeah. system. Yeah. By that time, you might be able to best buy spend three hundred dollars and get a brand yeah. new, you know. But for our purposes, to extend the life of yeah. the Wentworth devices, it makes sense to us. Because if we can get another year out of Wentworth, I think it's well worth what we spent. So that's that's our plan. I just <coughs> I wanted you guys to know that because I think we're gonna get those questions. Yeah. And and it's just logistically and financially, it doesn't make sense to try to sell them out to the staff public. Um, and we have already um, forewarned the middle school folks that this is our intent. Um, so the devices. We did a functional requirement session with the staff. We also did one with all the students. So we sent them um, surveys and had them fill out the surveys. We collected the results. And this is basically, these are the device requirements you need to have. So they're pretty basic, you know, you're going to find them on a lot of devices, um, with the exception of some ability to work offline and specialty software. So as we talked about before, the Chromebooks are really portals to the internet. So what we're looking at right now is there are Chromebooks that have, you know, 32 gig of memory or 64 gig of memory. So I'm looking at those because with that, you potentially could work offline, store, and then when you reconnect to the, net, to the um, internet, you could forward your work. So we are looking at minimal ability to um, store, store and forward. Um, and then the specialty software. So there's some specialty software. Um, for example, uh, Lego Robotics, and there's some special services software, and in the music department, they have some specialty software that has to be loaded to the device. There, there's no viable online solution for it. So in that case, we're gonna retain some of those laptops that we purchased. We're gonna put them on cards. We already have the cards. We already have the laptops. We already have the image. Um, and we're just gonna keep those in the classrooms where they're needed. It would be very minimal. I would say maybe four or five cards. Uh, it's not gonna be a whole lot, but it's gonna be there for the use if they, if they need it. Um, I have talked to other tech directors at other schools where this works very well. So I feel confident that that's going to work for them. Um, for the most part, what we did was we actually <coughs> took a bunch of different kinds of Chromebooks and we put them in the hands of students and we said, what do, you, what do you like about these? What don't you like about them? Um, for the most part, they liked the Chromebooks. They felt like they were lighter. They were more portable. Um, they were easy to use. We had the touch screen and the, the folded the tablet. Um, they liked that um, functionality on them. So I think that the, I feel confident that the Chromebooks are gonna work fine for them and they're gonna like them. Um, questions about this? I guess I didn't realize, so a Chromebook has three to four USB ports on it? Yeah, now they do, yeah. So you could bring a thumb drive if you really needed something put onto it and take oh, it off. Look at that face. No, no, no. We could have a lot of But oh, it's oh, for no. connectivity for like um, external mic, assistive yeah. technology. Oh, bigger keyboard. Um, oh, right. Yeah, a mouse or whatever. But um, mostly the requirements for that were around assistive technology. Oh, okay. And, and um, the Bluetooth as well. We have some um, yeah. different hearing assistive technology that needs to plug into that. So the plan moving forward is these Chromebooks. Um, we have yet to actually nail down what make and model a Chromebook we're going to get. We're still sort of negotiating that. Um, but I've, I've budgeted 275 per Chromebook. 
we do pay $25 one time um, for a management fee. That's for our ability to manage it in a console. Um, then the teachers will actually get laptops because they do need full laptops for things like grade book and um, a couple of other things. Um, what's rolled in, I'm going to show you the total budget for this, for just the end user devices. What's rolled into that are the teacher devices, student devices, the bags or sleeves, whatever we end up with. Um, we got a lot of feedback from the students that they like just the, the heavy duty sleeves so they can yeah. put them so in their backpacks. Um, the they hate the bags that were provided mm -hmm. by the state, as do we, yeah. because they are literally replaced in their entirety every year. Okay. And they, when they so drop them, they don't protect the, the device at all. So yeah, we've complained about that and we've gotten nowhere, so we'll, we'll get our own bags. Um, we do have off-campus filtering licenses, so um, this is through SOPUS Web Gateway. Essentially what it allows us to do is filter the devices no matter where they are. Um, spare batteries, spare adapters, keyboard covers, there's a lot of moving parts that kind of go into this budget. So this is what it looks like. Your year one total investment, three, basically 320. Now typically for a middle school tech refresh, we'll budget, Kate, would you say half a million, somewhere around 500,000, so that, that fits well within it. I just tacked on, if you recall in the past years, I've always given you guys cyclical refresh. So extrapolated out six years, see what it looks like over the six years. So, and I can give you those line item details if you guys want it, I couldn't fit it onto the screen. Um, but this is, these are the numbers that I sort of came up with. Year four, it's a little higher because, um, you know, I think, yeah, you, Chromebooks are, they're, they're going to take a lot of abuse at the middle school, especially if we have all the grades taking them home. So the average annual investment is roughly 115. Now something I wanted to point out here for you guys and everybody at home is that MLTI for us, because we have sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, was not free. It wasn't a free program. We had to lease the sixth grade laptops. We did end up buying um, teacher uh, the EdTech laptops. We ended up paying for uh, ADP, which is the accidental damage protection on the devices. Um, and there were other things like keyboard covers and whatever that we ended up, and we also paid for the Sophos um, web filtering. So if you compare that number to what we actually paid out over four years, it's 113. Okay. It's about the same. Well, I'm surprised. I, I would have thought that the MLTI I think would have been more just um, knowing how At the end operate. of the day, <laughs> this is a very conservative number. So we'll say <coughs> that, that at the end of the day, it probably is more because we had to pay for damages. So now, the other thing that I want everybody to keep in mind, and I didn't roll it into these numbers because I need to go back and do some adjustments, um, but we do collect the $25 right. fee from each family each year, so that will play a part in replacement cycles and um, spare um, adapters and cables or whatever. But I, this is just basically raw numbers without that rolled into it. <coughs> okay, so our plan moving forward is we do have to choose a device. <laughs> we will, um, for both the, the students and the teachers, so we're going to do that. Um, over the summer, we'll receive them. We won't, if they're Chromebooks, you don't have to image them, so that's nice. You just have to basically assign them out in a console. That's something that else that's really nice about the Chromebooks is that it's a very quick swap. If somebody, if something happens to somebody's device, it's a very quick swap out for us. Um, we do need to continue to work with the staff to transition them to cloud services and apps. Um, we are getting help from the K2 teachers who are kind of saying, it's okay. <laughs> It'll all work out. Um, and there's a, a large group in southern Maine that's all going through the same thing. So um, one of the school districts has actually set up a website that has here, this is equivalent to this, and this is equivalent to this. So it's good because we're all sort of, you know, collaborating and helping each other out with that. Um, we do have to take care of the exceptions. So we'll have to get the, the carts of laptops up and running and imaged and deployed out. 
Um, and then we'll have the deployment of the actual Chromebooks, which will be different for the kids. We'll have to do some training with both the kids and the teachers so that they kind of know proper care and use and how to use the Chromebooks. And that's it. Questions, comments, concerns? <coughs> Go ahead, Ellen. Ken, I, I'm, I'm always impressed by the enormous amount of work that you and your team do. Um, so how many new staff were did you add between in the past five years, if you go back five? So I started here five years ago. Yeah. And when I came on board, there were four of us. Um, so one, five. There were five of us. So we've added three people. We added um, a web coordinator, web services coordinator, um, mm -hmm. somebody who takes care of all of the websites, the internet, all the online services. And he helps out with a lot of the different applications that we have as well. Um, we added a, what I call a K-12 tech, frontline tech person, who mm -hmm. is really out in the field. He takes care of a lot of the um, issues that are triaged. So out at each phase level, we have, we call them tech techs. Um, so we have one at each phase level. They do sort of the frontline triage, and anything that they can't handle, they will escalate to our K-12 specialist, not Alicia, but um, Derek, who will, the, the, um, he's the plugs and wires person. So he'll go in and take a, he's got a beauty image machine or he's got to take a machine apart or something like that. That's, he's the one that does that. And uh, we added a um, network telecom um, admin, so somebody to help us with the back end network infrastructure stuff we've added so many um, back-end <coughs> pieces. And when you go from 50 meg to a gigabit, there's, yeah, you, you have to have somebody to actually make all of that work. So. And do you have enough staff? Um, we're still sort of evaluating that. I mean, I, I promised everybody when we went live with um, the high school one-to-one that I wouldn't ask for staff that year. We were going to kind of sit back, assess, and see if we had enough staff. Mm -hmm. um, now that we've added all those additional devices out at the K2s that we never had, and we are also going to be <coughs> um, self-funding and owning the middle school devices, so mm -hmm. instead of just shipping them off to MLTI to be fixed, now we are going to have to um, deal with all that maintenance. Um, you might see a request from me next year, but I, I reserve the right. We're gonna, we're gonna kind of, we'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. I have an amazing staff, amazing. My, the IT group works incredibly hard, and I got to give them all the credit. Um, I wanted to just say that um, I really appreciate how careful and thoughtful you are with the investing that you do. I think that you are an amazing resource for the school department. Your cost savings in the first place because you're a shared service between the town and schools, but then I feel like every time you come and talk to us, you tell us about more ways that you're being so careful. <laughs> and like Thank you. between the printers and the, the paper cut system and then telling us about this 18,000 and keeping some and selling some, I feel like you're so careful to evaluate the way that you're spending money and I feel like it's always good news coming from you. Good. Um, <laughs> <We> try. <laughs> really um, my one just question for clarification was um, the grant process and qualification, I know that you don't know exactly what that's going to look like yet with MLTI. You think it's going to be a need-based sort of a thing. So um, once we find out about that, what little money we may qualify for, would that go towards the, um, would that start to cut into that year one? Yes. Okay. So that would go directly back towards the year one purchase price okay. of whatever we had. Um, what, we've, what we've been told is that seventh and eighth grade devices will be covered. Okay. We don't know to what extent. And then we will hear something later on about the grant qualification parameters. And so I think they're going to be um, 
that's going to be the option, seventh and eighth grade devices. That's what you'll be able to put in for, and then kind of what you get back is a question mark. Obviously, we will fill out all the grant applications. We'll try to get whatever money we can back. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping to get something yeah. back. So I, I am hoping that that number is actually not going to be that number. Yeah. It's going to be offset by something. So it might even bring us down to closer to that average, which was, I mean, not that right. far so off, yeah. but we might yeah. even be down closer to the 113 than the 115. Yeah. So for sure. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I mean, it's just kind of amazing that the crisis that was that is looming for a lot of districts we are not in. So, thank you and your team for having been forethought. Seriously, this could have been hugely horrible yeah. for us. But. It was. I got to hand it to Dennis Nathan, Michelle Lemlin, and the whole crew. I mean, Dennis really drove getting that network in place last year because I think you know I. We were attending the meetings and kind of saw it coming, and Dennis really wanted to address the end user issues, yeah. the latency, the connectivity issues. So it, it has worked out well for us. And I know that there was a lot of apprehension about moving away from Apple and moving to HP, and I think that worked out really well for us. <laughs> I'm really relieved that we did that because that was a, that was a, a huge, it was, it was if nothing else, it just took up an enormous amount of time for a lot of people trying to wade through that. And I think they still have a lot more they're going to have to wade through. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so that takes us to 7.2, the student progress update. You may remember back in November? December? Yeah. Actually, it was the first of December. <laughs> it felt like November. <laughs> Monique was here giving us um, uh, a student progress update, and we hadn't quite yet had the 2015 16 student state test score results. So now we have that, and Monique's going to kind of give the other part, like the part two to that presentation for us tonight. If you recall, the state has not yet released <coughs> their results. Uh, they were in the process of, thanks Jen, they were in the process of um, building the report site um, and actually scoring the assessments and setting the benchmarks and doing all this work, as you recall. <coughs> we had the SBAC assessment and through legislative action that was eliminated, so that left both the testing companies and the state scurrying quite a bit. <coughs> So I'm going to bring you back a little bit to that time. Uh, just to give you a heads up, this slide describes the changing landscape of the MEA. If you recall, it was the SBAC, and now for three through eight, it's called the Empower Me or Empower Maine assessment for grades three through eight, ELA and math. And then in grade 11, um, we're back to the SAT, which is a revised SAT. Uh, <coughs> as well. And then science, things really haven't changed a whole lot. The state has not taken action on the next gen science standards. Uh, and so uh, that assessment has not shifted. Uh, what we do with the state test data, we compare it with the other data sets that we have. Uh, and we're always pressed for time to do that, uh, especially in trying to work with classroom teachers. They're busy doing all kinds of things. But we look at it, we look at the comparing the state with neighboring districts, but we also track the grade level over time, and we also look at cohort, follow a group of students. So this is really the first year of state data. Uh, so I'll give you just the start of our progress. I included this slide because this, this slide because it's an important reminder of some of the shifts that have occurred in the district over time. So let's take a look at the literacy. This 
uh, slide describes the literacy for grades three through eight and including grade 11. The red bars are the Scarborough results, and those results are, for example, at grade three on your left there, that 77 references 77% of our students met or exceeded the standard. That bar, that proficiency bar was set um, by the state looking at their data. Uh, the blue bars represent the state. So you can see a bit of a trend, but um, clearly we're outperforming the state. Uh, note that at K-5, we're in the second year of illiteracy uh, curriculum implementation. And then grade six, eight, we did spend, uh, four years ago, we had quite a shift in our literacy curriculum. And 9-12 has been working, um, the department at the high school has been working pretty heavily on alignment to the Common Core Standards, the State of Maine Standards, uh, and building common rubrics and looking at their core content, content to make sure that their uh, coursework <coughs> is aligned with each other. Here is a graph of looking at literacy across grades three through five. So for example, on your left, those three bars, the light blue, middle blue, and dark blue bar represent grade three, grade four, and grade five. And this is just a quick visual way to take a look at three, four, five, uh, and compare Scarborough performance to Maine again, but also Falmouth, Kennebunk, South Portland, and Yarmouth, which are the school districts that we generally compare ourselves to, I believe through the teacher negotiation process, that was one of the groups, these were the groups of schools um, <coughs> that our teachers were interested in comparing um, ourselves to. Kennebunk, both in terms of demographics and the CPAIR report uh, that um, you all saw last year, um, is probably our closest comparison district. If you look at free and reduced lunch numbers, if you look at investment in education, if you look at other demographics like community wealth, that's probably the closest uh, to Scarborough. But here, notice um, 345 and Scarborough, pretty consistent performance across those grade levels. That we're wondering is maybe in part because all of our teachers have volunteered to participate in the training around the new curriculum implementation. We do offer a stipend in the summer for them to participate, but typically we have about 95% representation in the summer. And then during the school year, we also contract and have a consultant come in, work with teachers in their classroom. We do release teachers for a day to do some prep work with the consultant, and everyone is included and expected to participate at that point in time. So that's a way in which we ensure quality in terms of new curriculum implementation, but support teachers along that path. In grades six through eight, uh, the note there describes some of the things that have been going on at the middle school. Um, grade six performance compared to seven and eight is um, curious to us. Um, there's a little bit more of a discrepancy there than we'd like to see. So we've had conversations with middle school folks wondering why. Is it the curriculum? What's going on there? Uh, and they're continuing to explore that. Uh, literacy in grade 11, this is the SAT. There's only one year of assessing at the high school. Uh, and you'll notice that, that our participation in Scarborough is, um, exceeds the Kennebunk, uh, our um, performance exceeds the Kennebunk performance there. We're about in the middle there. Of note here, when they set the benchmarks for the SAT, SAT scores come back with the numbers. Those scores come back through the college board. The students get their results. Um, for this, the SAT is also used for state testing, so the reports, the scores that we get back are proficiency levels. What the state decided to do in agreement with five other states was to set that proficiency level that at the standard mark is a college readiness benchmark, which essentially means that a, a student who meets at or exceeds and a 75% um, likelihood of scoring at least a C or better in a college level course. So that was a way in which to kind of give that at, um, at the standard um, a better definition, a statistically solid description mm -hmm. for performance. <coughs> and that's the same also for math. Mathematics, just switching gears, 
Why is Yarmouth zero? Did they not report? Thanks for bringing that up. I don't know. Um, I went on the, the new reporting site. There must be something going on with their data. I looked there on one portion of the site, and then I looked it up in a different way. The asterisk, um, it's rather curious because the asterisk, when you look at the definition of the asterisk in that place, um, there is language to the fact that they're protecting the privacy of the students. But typically that's with very small schools. They had like a 90 98% participation rate, which would have meant over 150 students. So I'm not sure if they've got a problem with their data. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if it was an opt-out situation. No, it was. I looked at that. I looked at their participation rate, and it clearly wasn't. What was our participation rate? Our participation rate, I believe, was about 97%. I'd have to double check that, but it was pretty much across the board at that level. So in mathematics, again, you see a trend. We're a little curious, um, again, grade six kind of is a little closer to state average, even in mathematics. <clears throat> and across three through five, we're also curious about our third grade students and their performance. Uh, we're curious about that because it's pretty different than grade four and five. But if you think about when we started our math curriculum, we're in the fifth year, so that yellow bar for Scarborough, those fourth graders would have been the first class to receive the new curriculum. So the third graders would have had second year teachers. Um, so we're, I'm looking forward to next year's data to see if there's any kind of emerging trend. We really can't say a whole lot without three years of data, but it just kind of, it'll be interesting to see. I can, I can hope. Mm -hmm. At 6-8, uh, again, if you look at that sixth grade performance, um, that we ask ourselves quite a few questions. <coughs> when I met with the middle school folks, one of their wonders, which is Jen talked about a little bit, was this, the only difference there between math and ELA there, there really isn't much. We're still concerned about that sixth grade performance. Those kiddos are in those portables. Um, and the connectivity issues, we're really wondering if those connectivity issues were significant <coughs> enough to impact the results. Mm. So what we're, um, as you heard, those access points um, were switched over this past summer. Uh, so uh, actually Alicia is going and talking with classroom teachers now, interviewing everyone in the portables to see if the connectivity w issues are still there, if they've noticed anything. Cause from Jen's perspective, we haven't heard anything, but she wants to make sure, especially as we're now about to enter into another season of testing. So we are looking at all aspects of that. Those kiddos, are they receiving less instructional time because they have to walk back and forth from specials to the main building? Are teachers receiving the same level of professional development and amount of time uh, as opposed to the classroom teachers? Our instructional coaches are located in the main building. Are they spending the same amount of time with the sixth grade teachers and the seventh grade teachers? We're looking at everything there. Um, we also are going to be looking over time to see if that pattern continues. If it does, we'll be digging a little bit deeper. <coughs> grade 11 for math. Again, similar to literacy, our um, students fared pretty well compared to the other districts. Again, that benchmark for in science, we have lots of years of data. We've got seven years of data here. Uh, for grade five, you'll notice that in the last, one of the pieces that's interesting is in the last three years, there's a separation from the state in terms of our student performance, which is quite curious because we haven't done any significant curriculum shifts in the area of science, but that may also be the reason why. Uh, because the MEA assessment um, has not aligned to the NGSS, nor have we done any work around that with the fifth grade teachers because they've been so focused on literacy. But maybe the gains in literacy and their ability <coughs> to read and write may have impact scores. We're not sure. In eighth grade, uh, the teachers, uh, two years ago now, came to me after looking at the data and said, we're not happy with this. It's erratic. It goes up and down. What's going on? We took a, lot, a little bit of a deeper look into that. They weren't really happy with uh, the curriculum they were using. <coughs> Again, if you recall, we were using science kits, Thanks, Jen. Uh, science kits that were 
are almost 15 years old at the middle school. So we took a look and we did a pretty in-depth review of three different science curriculum materials. They chose the iQuest uh, NSF-funded curriculum materials. And in this first year, um, the results are looking kind of promising. Uh, so again, we hope to have that trend continue um, over time. And again, this is grade eight. Those folks, those kiddos are in the main building where um, hope, uh, we don't have any, uh, this paper pencil, sorry. This paper pencil, no connectivity issues at all. Um, just uh, need a sharp pencil sharpener, <laughs> a pencil. Grade 11, uh, grade 11 in the last few years, we are noticing a little bit of a trend towards um, state performance. Uh, but interestingly enough, at the high school, the department has been working on the new science standards. Uh, and so they may be working those practices into their classroom, and that may be a part of the reason why the trend is towards the state, because that assessment may be um, assessing different skills. But we're talking about it and looking into it. One of our biggest challenges, though, um, is time. Um, we love to have the teachers look at the data, dive deeply into the data, compare it with other data sets, um, but getting the time for the teachers to come together is a challenge for us. Uh, and if we were ever so um, lucky to have some additional late start times, I would line up our data maps when we get our results with some of those late start times and have teachers working groups learning how to use the data um, and compare data sets uh, and start drawing some conclusions about the data and considering what kinds of shifts in practices they might consider around that. Um, we don't necessarily use just the state data to drive all our decisions, but we do use this state data along with other data to inform our decisions, both for individual students, but also for curriculum um, and program pieces. So it's multi-purpose. Uh, we do like three years of trend data, so we wouldn't be doing the trend data analysis for a little bit of time. But uh, also, our time is quite um, busy right now, getting ready for the next testing season. Uh, so hopefully, they've got the kinks out of the application itself. Uh, we've taken care of some of the connectivity um, <coughs> issues, and we're getting ready to um, test. And hopefully, with the state and their improvements, we'll have these results back uh, closer <laughs> to July which is what we used to have, um, if not sooner than that. Um, but the testing window will run about March 20th uh, all the way into a little bit into May because one of the changes this year is for the literacy, they've taken the writing piece um, out of that and they're putting it in in May um, separate. Um, March 20th to April 14th is the window for the math and the, it'll be the reading and a little bit of writing, but they've moved the essay out just to spread it out a little bit. Thank you. I have a question. Um, when we're selecting new curriculum mm -hmm. in, in any subject area, do we, I mean, I'm sure you know what other districts are using. Do um, So are we using the same ELA curriculum in mm -hmm. third grade as Falmouth and Yarmouth or are other aspirational districts for us? Um, we are, uh, most districts in the area have moved towards the reading writing workshop model. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if they're using the most recent version of that or not. Uh, we actually collaborate with some of the districts. Actually, the consultants we have came from Cumberland Greeley area. She was a teacher in that district. Um, so they've been using it for quite a bit. Um, I'm not sure about Falmouth. Um, we really took a look at um, three different curricula when we made that decision, and we researched um, not only those districts, but we went um, regional as well in looking at those districts um, and looking at the research behind the curriculum. I was just um, wondering, because when we're comparing on the chart yep. to Falmouth yep. or Yarmouth, and you know, their scores seem higher across the board, I was just wondering, is it you know, a lot of it is money. I know that the investments that they can make that we can't, but um, I was just wondering if their curriculum might align differently or better with the state testing that is all over the place. If somehow they've just were lucky and hit the right curriculum at the right year or whatever. 
Most school districts for ELA and for um, math use pretty similar curriculum. We're a little different in our math. Um, most folks are using the program Everyday Math, or um, some are still using Connected Math at middle schools. Um, when we took a look at that nationally, um, there are districts moving away from that in light of the Common Core, and the research was pretty solid with the math in focus yep. um, curriculum, so we've been focusing in on that. Um, and our students are doing um, relatively well. Um, we've had increased, well, with the testing, state testing, it doesn't look right. It doesn't fit. It's exactly. hard to compare. Yeah. I was just wondering. Um, I would like uh, an analysis as we move forward. Uh, I am concerned when I look at the sixth grade, especially when you look at the, the three through five, and then you look at sixth grade, and then seventh grade. I mean, it just doesn't seem to compute. Yeah, and, and you do have to look at the state trend as well, um, because it's not, straight, it's not the Correct. same across. So w what we really look for is that state trend. We look at our trend, um, and then we look for the anomalies. But I agree with you, sixth grade is rather curious, and third grade in, um, in literacy is rather curious, as, and mathematics is rather curious as well. So it's, uh, I know you'll be on top of it, and, and uh, I know that our teachers are on top of it, but it, uh, if it continues, I mean, it is, it, it's bothersome. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to go back and look at, <coughs> so a year ago they were fifth graders, so they took a test as well, so the sixth graders, to see if their numbers we can go back and look at some of that. One of the challenges between the assessments is that we used to receive results as reading and writing, and now we receive the results as literacy. Right. So if you're taking one right. assessment okay. and comparing it to two separate yeah. assessments, mm -hmm. um, the state has recently released, but I believe they released it on a per student basis, and they're still working on releasing reports that will be more helpful to us so we can do some, um, dive deeper into the data and see some of the breakout data mm -hmm. um, and go a little bit deeper with that. Um, right. yeah. Because even now these students that were sixth graders when, they're, when they took that test last year are now going how to be seventh graders. Yeah. So how did they do this year? And you and might even it might be a help. Even right. going backwards, looking at how they did, even if they were previous assessments, how did they do relative to each other? Could be a telltale data. Donna? So I know these questions, two questions I'm going to ask you, it might be more, I mean, you might be having to really project about by through looking at this, but it, it appears to me like our, our, our students, when compared to the state of Maine scores, do quite well overall. And the test is really look matching our, our kids' knowledge with the standards. Mm -hmm. So if, like in Massachusetts, the MCAS determines graduation, if the MEA here were to determine for our high school kids graduation, our kids would graduate. Uh, uh, percentage, a large percentage of our students would. Yeah. It would all depend on where we set that graduation requirement. Yeah, um, okay. We aren't looking at um, using the state assessment as a graduation requirement. Mm -hmm. That said, um, I'm certainly open to the possibility that if a student wants to use state assessment data or their SAT data as a piece of evidence, uh -huh amongst a body of evidence right. that um, tells um, the panel or whoever that they are proficient, it's a piece of evidence that shows their proficiency in a particular content area, mm -hmm. why not? Well, that was going to be my next question, so <laughs> you answered it right there because that, that was my, I was kind of just protect, projecting out about proficiency-based education and what that may mean for Scarborough kids and so. Yeah, it is a piece mm -hmm. of evidence. Yeah. Um, and, and while our students do well, we um, 
relatively well relative to the state mm -hmm. uh, until that's 100 percent, until other mm -hmm. data points are at 100 um, percent. We still need those support mechanisms in place to problem solve, figure out what works for kids um, moving forward. Uh, we uh, are looking at our academic support models. We're looking at um, other pieces of evidence mm -hmm. um, as well as instructional supports for our students to make sure that all students um, graduate from high school at high levels of achievement. Thank you. Thank you. It's hard to see when we're in a straight line. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <coughs> we hope that the state decides to stick with whatever they're doing for a few years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't that be good? good. That's <laughs> nice. And the folks at the DOE would really like to do so. Well, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure they would. <laughs> Kelly? Yeah. I, I just wanted to ask if, if everybody got a copy of the commission reform to reform public education funding and improving student performance in Maine, the phase one report. Was that the email was that from the MSMA? Day? Yes. Oh. A couple days ago. I didn't then you have an opportunity did, to look at it yet, yet, but we, got we it, did we get it. it. Okay. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure certain. <coughs> well this one says draft, but then I got another one that was the report. Yeah. So. Do you want to share some details about that or no? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, well, I'll tell you there, it, really when you come right down to it, it there's nothing new because uh, there's a, of course an introduction and then uh, there are, let me see, objective one, improve classroom instruction at all grade levels. Number two, <laughs> all students graduate high school proficient on time okay. and through expanded access to high quality educational opportunities. All children are kindergarten ready and proficient readers by the end of third grade. And number four, greater efficiency is achieved in the use of resources. I mean, those uh, are just the four bullet points. There are numbers underneath you know, explaining this, but it I didn't, I didn't read it yet, Jackie. So is, is this new. from LePage? No, this is the report that is going, that was made. By the Blue Ribbon Commission. Uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission. Oh, okay. Exactly. Uh, the Joint Commission yeah. that was uh, developed by LePage. Yeah. Uh, and this is the phase one report. Okay. They were called the Blue Ribbon Commission, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We just got yeah. it. Mm -hmm. We got it We did get that. And as I say, I don't. I didn't see anything new, quite frankly. So the prediction. No, but uh, I think what what's going to be new is what is in the governor's budget that contradicts uh, that plan there. That's that's. I think that's the, the change in the EPS formula with the yeah. forty-eight. Whatever. What the governor is saying. That's what the governor is saying. The is commission doesn't support that. What the that. commission said. That's right. Yeah. yeah. The commission's report, in my opinion, doesn't support no. what the governor is proposing. Exactly. But we won't have our numbers until at least June. So oh gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll we'll long um, the, the ship will have sailed on our budget, so we have no idea. Oh, are they? That's, that's nice. Okay, that takes us to 8.0. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Hope everybody has a fun and safe vacation. Thank you. Very good.